friendly agent of a control corporation. And like you, face grotesque, ruthless, cruel characters and situations usually appearing harmless and pleasant, but in fact are perverse and putting on a charade. I am Admittedly, a manipulator and coordinator of symbol systems, an expert on all phases of his interrogation, brainwashing, control, and I've constructed the following. So, uh, yes, you will forget that you are under control. Some have called me a control fanatic, a poet. A seer, a true human virus, who uses telepathy to govern the masses. After all, it is the theory, it is life, and you have paid for the treatment you are now to receive. The network is the dark laboratory of control. The network is the bright laboratory of freedom. I am the one person in this world with a million separate bodies. You are that person in the world made up of a million separate bodies. You are a separate body, never alone with the millions of others that are around you. A viral entity that can control the entire planet through contamination. I'm not sure I should go on. You can leave if you want that. You can. Now, look at those exit signs. Now, they just might not be exit signs, but you're welcome to go. Or shall we carry on with the next episode? Still gripped by the illusion of the horizon. We feed the system with a data set of 15,000 ideas of God. The generator makes a new belief construct based on the set. Then the discriminator tries to spot the difference between a human-made notion and one created by the generator. The aim is to fool the discriminator into thinking that the new belief is not only real, but amplifies the wish fulfillment of the ideas of God. Then we have the result. The AI generated God is one to one. Each man, each woman, each being, as my relative Samuel Abu Lafia says, is her, his, whomever's own Messiah. us, 
Are you having a tea ceremony with life? Is life the ceremony? I was in Athens last summer, and myself and my family, my two kids, we lived on the edge of a hill. We were staying there in an Airbnb, of course, at the Philippopas Hill in the neighborhood of Petrolona. There is, for those of you who've been there recently to Athens, graffiti everywhere. And there is something about it that's, well, it's just perfect. It sets off a kind of degradation in a sense, a city written on, something so present for a city that's so old, a signature of the now written, the now over the past. The hill of Philippopas is rocky, uh, desert-like and sparse. And you walk and you walk and you walk and you walk. And that's something I just love to do when I travel, to walk, to get lost. Heading somewhere, nowhere, everywhere. Ah, I think. What might appease this storm? Incredibly ferocious. An offering to a god? A conversation with nature? With what powers must I speak? Must I appease? Who is this god of the storm? How can I console this anger, this nature, this appetite, this storm? What have I done for this storm to come to me? Yes, this storm is after me. It wants me. It wants to hurt me. I must propitiate myself to this. This what? What shall I call this wrath? This vengeance. What have I done for this to be happening? How can this be happening to me, to us, simply trying to have a pleasant lunch on tour? Myth was a recognizable media that helped the Athenians shape their identity and strengthen their sense of space. Apollo, the god of light, dream and prophecy, the shining one, visible form, comprehensible knowledge and moderation. Dionysus, the god of intoxication and rapture, formless flux, mystical intuition, excess, the drive to bloody dissolution, annihilation, and a strong and gleeful admission of the terror and meaninglessness of life. The Apollonian, a world of distinct individuals. The Dionysian, a world where separate individual identities have resolved and human beings find themselves reconciled with the elemental forces and energies of nature. The Apollonian, a world of distinct individuals. Dionysian, a world where separate individual identities have dissolved and human beings find themselves reconciled with the elemental forces and energies of nature. Through Dionysian rapture, we become part of a living being which is joy and eternal recreation. We are fused. The union of these two artistic powers nature called a mystery and the origin of Greek tragedy. My trip to Greece was a search to understand and gain intuition into this union, and how I had become exiled to myself. How from being mute, I began to sing, to cry, to weep. And with that, I became the Buddha that laughs, present to the great mystery and the great joy of being alive. Under the protection of Athena, the goddess of rationality, 
that replaces the old mythical religious and irrational regime. The trilogy of Aeschylus, Agamemnon, the libation bearers, the Eumenides, ends with the entrance of the mythical Orestes into the logical world of Athens. Remember, in Agamemnon, Orestes killed his mother, Clytemnestra, because she, secretly living with her lover, had killed his father. The play concerns the incessant vengeance of these deceits. Athena puts an end to it. In the weeks ahead, we will go to the Oracle at Delphi. My 12-year-old son, Roman, and I. Maybe the oracle will tell me of the storms to come, the storms that were raging, always raging, always somewhere. What and who is this oracle? To the oracle, these ancients went bearing the most extraordinary gifts, marble statues, works of gold, tridents, chalices, coins, the lingy things sparkling and shiny and lovely. To have a seance, you bring gifts, strange gifts, like the bruised egos that New Yorkers brought to their Freudian analyst in the 50s, like other Viennese in the 20s brought to America, the dark noir lighting of Fritz Lang, the strange, deranged, precise dances of Mary Bingman, modernist architecture. What else do people bring to the oracles but uncertain desires, ambitions? Now you, audience, must think of yours because we will be seeing the oracle very soon. As the days and dreams go on, I propose to my wife that we buy an apartment in Athens, that we live here, that we make Athens our home. The idea is so strong to me, so convincing, so real, that now this graffiti town is my town, my home. I live here. I am so excited thinking of the right place to live. And then, and then, I am alone. And strangely in the sky is thunder and lightning. And we close the windows of our Airbnb apartment and retreat inside. How to begin? And to what end? To begin without ending. To begin before beginning without ending, to end beginnings and endings. Inside where? Where? Where, 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 am, I? where am I? Where am I? I live here, here in Athens, and the rain comes and comes, and I am here on the couch in this room in exile. Exile. I just keep thinking about this. It seems to me to be at the heart of everything because the exile's always away, away from something, kept away, willingly or unwillingly, gone away. Banish, banded, bother, without brother, without mother, without sister, without song, without language, without friends. He is the other, the abject, the contagion, the castaway, the parasite, the unwanted, the unlovable. And nobody wants to love the unloved. Just pile on all that hate, and vengeance, and scorn, and humiliation, and abject thing. We just need to kill him. We need to kill that ugly thing. Just kill that pretty thing. You're banished, exiled. That's better than prison or death. You're exiled. 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 The verb exile comes from the old French word essayer, meaning banish, expel. Of course, there are all kinds of reasons for exile, but we can be certain that anyone banished has committed an offense to the powerful.
Once the rain cleared, we continued towards the Acropolis. There were hundreds of people from all over, ascending the hill from various sides. It's an extraordinary sight from afar, just glistening marble. I realized we were not simply tourists, but pilgrims. We were on pilgrimage to commune with the gods. We were a community of sorts, perhaps nothing more than a group of tourists on a cruise. What, who could say, what each of us wanted, what we were in search of, that glimmer or crack in time that showed us, yes, Apollo was here, and Poseidon, and Hermes. And on the vast plateau across the sheltering sky and the sea beyond, we would commune with the heavens and know, even for a second, what it was to be one, not just with others, not just ourselves, but with the whole of time. Waiting through the hundreds of people scrambling about, incessantly taking pictures, pictures, cameras, photographs, big cameras, phone cameras, video cameras, FaceTime, iPads. Somehow it seemed that in their very taking, they would not only record this eventful moment, but give meaning to it. The meaning perhaps of, look, I am here. I was here. I did this, did this, done that. Me, 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 me. I marveled at the genius of it all and the insanity of all of us. Or was it the insanity of them and the genius of us? I thought I saw in this atomized mass Socrates and himself. I was in love with him as a physical thing, a man described as unseemly. Ugly. What ugliness could be so extraordinary to be remarked on so often? Amidst all this order and perfection, a brilliant, ugly thing, a kind of monstrosity. What was beneath it all? These ruins, this stone, these texts and vases, statues and votive offerings, these immensely ordered buildings and decorative columns. How many people did it take to build such a place? How many slaves, captives, artisans, and engineers? The entire will of the city. I remember being at the Telluride Film Festival, talking with the renowned British filmmaker, Peter Greenaway. He told me he loved to see the rotten underneath the pristine. The rotten underneath the pristine, the subterranean. What indeed was behind all these ordered columns, behind this brilliant whiteness? Myth or reason? I suppose Miletus, like many sociopathic narcissists, rich to boot, could not stand this ugly gadfly and simply wanted this menace, who, according to our accounts, was a little too perfect to be real. He was an excellent soldier, could drink everyone else under the table while debating, could devise the ideal state over dinner. However, well, this man just had to go, this Socrates. Miletus could not stand someone who says they are wise because they don't know. That was pure lunacy. And so, by public trial and 30 votes of a jury, just over 500, our old boy was sentenced to death. Death. Yeah, 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 yeah. The big question. 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 I remember my bearded poli sci professor looking like Marx, professing on Marx, writing on the blackboard, death, without death, no life. And so now, Socrates would have to show himself. The man pronounced by the Oracle of Delphi to be the wisest of all men. Well, wise because he said he didn't know anything. Socrates would now have to speak forth. He would have to speak forth about the excellence of the soul and the uncertainty of death. Because whatever lie behind that door, angel or devil, eternity or end, he 
he did not know, but go there he would, with open arms and open heart. There is something insolent and arrogant about Socrates. His mock humility seems a form of suicide. There's something disturbing and provoking about Socrates' performance here. Honestly, I think Morrissey is our contemporary Socrates, always questioning the beautiful, the just, the jealous, the state, the sexual desire. Really, the more I think about it, yes, Socrates has come back as the beautiful in Stephen Morrissey. This ground from which everything becomes and is becoming, from which we appear and know ourselves in losing ourselves, a community formed around music, formed as the participants, the individuals dissolved in the face or abyss or maw of the chaotic. Yes, the ugly, dreadful awe of this immense thing, the ugly, the unshapely, the unruly, the ill-formed nature would be given form by men and gods. Gods being powers we would shape and form. It is interesting to note that every Greek myth is ultimately connected in a chain of association with every other Greek myth, just as the parents of the gods whose children destroyed them are in turn destroyed by their children. And it is this cycle of vengeance that is stopped by Athena. These new Olympians are the gods we know. They are us as gods, with shape and character and outsized appetites. Gods who interact with us make demigods. These gods, like us, had control over many different aspects of life on Earth. The ancient Greeks built great temples and sanctuaries to their gods. They held festivals in their honor with processions, sports, sacrifices, and competitions. These gods were mean, angry, pleasant, cruel, loving. They fell in love with each other, argued with each other, and even stole from each other. Rape and storm narrativized the world with hundreds of appetites. This dread comes more and more into focus. It becomes a person, a god. This dread this appetite, this unreason, these forces of nature and in time become more and more into focus. They become a person, a god, like you and me, in the image of you and me. It was not at first so much our desire to be like gods as it was to be propitious to them, with them, for them. But of course we would have to, someday, kill them. Our aim is not the god's eye view, but the gods I power to shape and control reality. Like someone told me the other day, having just returned from a conference in the Ukraine, the future of everything. I asked about climate change and the person brusquely said, oh, this crowd, they don't care about that. They just want to upload themselves to the matrix and live forever. But as we know, humans can change things intentionally. But half the time, we don't quite get what we intend. Imagine that you're walking into this temple with all of these beautiful columns up the stairs and inside another chamber. And as you move further and further inside, shadows play against the walls, flames flicker, and you think you see an altar. And this shape to the back of you like a Goya painting, darkness within darkness, so black. But still you see, and you make sounds, and you shiver at these sounds, a horrible, delightful, ravenous sound. There, you think you see in the darkness, women, all naked, with matted hair, tearing a little child to pieces, hags tearing apart a child. Two old hags in the sanctuary are dismembering a living child above a basin. Well, that's the image that Nietzsche ends the birth of tragedy with. That is nature, with its horrible, delightful, ravenous, volcanic tornado of a sound and sounding of being, naked, with matted hair. That's it. That's climate change. That's atmosphere. That's 
the horrible, delightful, ravenous sound. Concealed by the light of Apollo, the Greeks created beautiful works of art precisely because, according to Nietzsche, they glimpsed into the abyss of life and saw it for what it is, that life lives on other lives. Life tears life apart. And the necessary compensation for this is to create beautiful works of art. Beauty, aesthetics, it is the only reason to live. There is nothing else but beauty. The beautiful is rooted in the dark mystery of the apprehension of the horror of life, of the contingency of life. The inevitable end of it, its awesomeness, its grandiosity, its complete indifference to us. All of it shattering, frightening, terrifyingly big. All too much. In the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche says that life can only be justified insofar as it is an aesthetic phenomenon. An extraordinary and insanely beautiful thing to say. It is only as an aesthetic phenomenon that exists in the world are eternally justified. Life finds me. The incredible only Does that astound you? Life finds me, according to Nietzsche, only through art. Life itself, it's a life, all of life, the all of creation. Its only meaning is to make life, which is art. And with that, when you look upon this world, are you not astounded by it? And yourself? Whatever is going on is having a hugely wonderful, indifferent, amoral time. All of it is for itself, as itself, and at every scale. And you, you pitiful herd, have not the courage just to see this, be this. But make no mistake about it, it's terrifying, because you, 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 me, 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 just doesn't matter. Which simply means it all does matter in the way you want it to. Don't be so sure, says Socrates. You don't know. It just doesn't matter. Or what matters is to just be or to live the examined life.
The Acropolis stands as the central repository of the Athenians' conception of themselves. It is an extraordinary temple complex, not unlike Angkor Wat or Bora Bador. You can imagine the many people of Athens day to day seeing from afar this extraordinary sight. And those days when one walked the slope in public processions, where along the way are numerous small altars, sanctuaries lining the path to the Acropolis, where votive figurines, the Cori, marble statues of young women, carved in different sizes with their restored body posture. These figures are placed to please the gods, the goddess Athena. This to bring them into conversation with oneself and these gods. Each, when properly cared for, would confer on its followers a caring for them, a beneficence, a benefit, a conversation with the god, a conversation with those around you in love and adoration, in fear and enchantment, in participation of its cult. A people were bound together, deepening the collective. They would share a cultural experience, providing healing rituals for the social problem of death. The ritual would involve music, dance, drama, and performance. The entire social group would be involved pain and grief would be transmuted into the joy of performance. The creation of beauty, the healing rhythms of dance and song, story and poetry, not forgotten, but changed and changed together. No longer recurrent, terrifying fantasy of the solitary victim, but the newly transformed addition to the culturally shared reality. A reality consensus in which a society was formed. Every city had its main god, but not to the exclusion of others. Alongside Athena and Athens, for instance, there were a number of other gods with various liturgies and rites that were practiced. Yet, as time progresses, certain archaic or ancient rites lose their potency. The high, the novelty is gone. The efficacy gone. So they emerge, get spliced up with others, lose their self-consciousness, their immediacy, their spell, the enrapture transformed and transposed. They upgrade after all. All gods must produce desired effects, and priests and politicians their control. In time, certain sacrifices, rituals, and cults are contested, pushed to the fringe, go underground, and eventually banished by greater control systems. We see this brilliantly shown in Pasolini's film version of the play Medea, and of course, William Burroughs, the unspeakable Mr. Hart. And all our tech companies today, thirsting for the singularity, the thrush of time defeated. What good is a god if it can't be daddy, 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 daddy? As does Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, a filthy rich American social media tycoon, whose Russian spiked algorithmic control machine fueled by the latest neuroscience feeds a plague-riddled apocalypse, a monstrous offspring of Fox News to buy time for more time. The high priest teaches his editors the tricks as they crawl up his ladder, making hands tremble and sweat from those coming over the wall. They love feeling the dear, meretricious, poor, wriggle and slobber, making people ugly and grinding their faces in it. See the action of Peter Thiel, this soul-searching tycoon with this, uh, dark side to his character, his instrument of control, one of a number of billionaires obsessed with discovering the means for achieving immortality. Using images of fear and death, he increases his control. However, he devalues time and invokes an implacable enemy. Young mutant heroes using the same patent A formula travel through time, bringing biologic plagues from the remote past to destroy him and his Judeo-Christian immoral temporal reality. Just as all cults, the appropriation of word image likes 
are the control indices to rearrange and control the imaginative synapses. Human sacrifice uses the cut-up technique to dismember these relations, seeking to short-circuit them in lines of flight, becomings, and war machines. In this sense, the young mutants share a common enemy, and an enemy with many names, globalization, Late capitalism, psychoanalysis, representation. Mr. Musk, Mr. Page. Information, statistics, data analysis, word viruses, all of these are the names of today's control. I later learned laments are sung by the women of the house and the closest neighboring women, often professional lamenters while swaying their bodies rhythmically. They are divided into three stages. Sung at the traditional wake in the house before the burial, during the burial procession, and at the tomb, as I was told later. The laments constitute a ritual which is considered as a social duty in most villages and the lamenters arrive automatically as soon as a person has died without being invited by the family of the deceased. A funeral cult is a body of religious teachings and practice centered on the veneration of the dead, in which the living are thought to be able to confer benefits on the dead in the afterlife, or to appease the otherwise wrathful ghost. Rituals were carried on for the benefit of the dead, either by their relatives or by a class of priests appointed and paid to perform the rite. From the 6th century onwards, legislation was introduced in Athens and other city-states aiming at the restriction of mourning of the dead, particularly women's lament, which by expressing pain, frustration, and anger was a powerful challenge to social order. The state's need to raise a standing army meant that death had to be glorified, not lamented. Cicero defined religio as cultus deorum, the cultivation of the gods, the cultivation necessary to maintain a specific deity with that god's cultus, cult, and required the knowledge of giving the gods their due. Religion is nothing other than the cultus of God. the 
first love are all kinds of propitiations. Because as humans, we will always measure that love, ask of that love for something in return. Love, as an exchange in turn, makes us take accounting of our love to ask ourselves how well we have loved and how well we have been loved. We ask, what can we do to increase the love we are given? In contrast is the love that is without want. Pure loving can only be that of a saint. It is a love without appetite. It is a beatific love, perhaps narcissistic. 